This is Dr. Anthony Revis, and this is SVSU General Chemistry 111, Chapter 6, Lecture 1. Lecture 1 of Chapter 6, Electronic Structures and Periodic Principles of Elements. In this chapter, we will look at electromagnetic energy. We will look at the Bohr model and theories related to it. We will also look at development of quantum theory. We will look at electronic structures of atoms and specifically we will learn about electronic configuration. We will also look at periodic variations in elements and properties based upon the periodic table. These topics will be covered, however they might not be covered in this order. A good starting place for a discussion about electromagnetic radiation is to consider that light exists as a wave. That existence of light as a wave is what we call electromagnetic radiation. The concept of electromagnetic radiation was perhaps first really discussed in a meaningful way by Maxwell at about 1873. And Maxwell proposed that visible light consisted of what we now know as electromagnetic radiation. So what is electromagnetic radiation? Here's our basic definition. Electromagnetic radiation is the emission and transmission of energy in the form of electromagnetic waves that have wave and particle properties. It is essentially saying that these particles travel in a wave pattern. So it's not a continuous line on the wave. It is burst of particles along a wave pattern. So you have these bursts of particles that are traveling like a wave. But that speed is such that you can't tell the separation. So electromagnetic radiation has both wave and particle properties. Another part that's essential to this definition is electromagnetic, meaning that it has electricity and magnetism. So, these are two ways we describe electromagnetic radiation. We describe it as having this magnetic electricity and we describe it as having this wave that consists of particles or particles traveling on a wave. And again, the first person to really put forth this theory in a meaningful fashion was Maxwell. And that is what visible light consists of. Electromagnetic waves. Understandings about electromagnetic radiation led to the understanding of electromagnetic spectrum. And what is the electromagnetic spectrum? The electromagnetic spectrum is the range of all types of electromagnetic radiation. And it sounds like we're double talking when you say this, but as you talk more about it and listen to it more, you'll be able to understand the differentiation between the terms. Now, sunlight consists of a range of broadly distributed wavelengths that form a continuous spectrum. In other words, sunlight has waves that cannot be distinguished with the naked eye. So you can't just look at sunlight and see a differentiation. When we look at sunlight, all we see is continuous light. But what we discover later is that that continuous light really consists of different wavelengths of light. The wavelength of light for the visible range is between 400 and 700 nanometers. In this chapter, you will learn these terms and you will also learn what these terms mean 
and how to apply them. So let's go back and look at this again. We have electromagnetic waves, which are particle-like, traveling on a wave. That traveling along the wave is continuous when we look at sunlight. In other words, we cannot differentiate the difference between the lengths of those waves. And what you now are hearing is that waves have length or electromagnetic radiation has different wavelengths. Okay, and that's important. So if you look at this diagram then, again we see that between 400 and 700, we have these beautiful colors. And these beautiful colors make up the continuous spectrum of light. To the left side on this diagram, we have UV, X-ray and gamma ray. To the right side on this diagram of the visible light, we have infrared, microwave, and radio. I should point something out to you that some authors prefer to switch this the other way, where this diagram is flipped, where radio is on the left side and gamma is on the right side. So you want to be aware that when you see a diagram, Take time to see which way the, uh, to read the diagram, okay? Consistently in my lectures, you will see it presented like it is here. So, we have this electromagnetic spectra, and it consists of wavelengths from gamma to radio. In the middle of this, or somewhere about the middle of this, we have the visible range from 400 to 700. This diagram shows you some of the usage of this knowledge about electromagnetic radiation. Really is pretty essential to the telecommunications for us. Not only telecommunications, but medicine and other types of technology. So technology really takes advantage of this uh, understanding. So you see some examples here. You see microwaves, cell phones, and wireless data handling on the right side of this diagram, all the way out to AM radio, ultrasound is on this side. And then on the left side, you'll see UV, which used in uh, dental care when they pop you with a light in the dentist's office when you're getting cavities filled. They'll say, hit it with some light. They're basically giving you UV. Then you have x-ray and you have PET scans. And then you have the cosmic rays. The gamma rays, that's where the Incredible Hulk would be. So if you watch the movies, the gamma rays, that's what turned Bruce Banner, I believe is his name, into the Incredible Hulk. Now, it's important you note that on the right side of the visible light, you start with infrared, and infrared is heating and things of that nature, and also the uh, pointers that you see around the red light pointers, on uh, the scopes that are on uh, rifles and things of that nature uh, will be infrared. To the right side of visible, this area of the electromagnetic spectra tends to be less biologically harmful that is it's less harmful to people to biological beings people and your pets and animals and that's important to note because oftentimes there are fears and concerns about things such as microwaves well if you're concerned about having a microwave in your home you might want to get rid of your cell phone and your wireless router as well because they both run off similar technology. Beyond the cell phone, there's your AM and the FM radios. The AM and FM radios, what grandpas used to have where they would turn the dials. Now you just punch a button for those frequencies. So to the right side of visible light, for the most part, is safe for biologicals when properly handled. To the left side, UV tends to cause more damage to biologicals, UV, X-ray, gamma, certainly gamma. 
uh, would, would do that. This is why when you're going for your UVs and your X-rays, they put the lead skirts on to protect them. You get your X-rays and then they remove the capes. So be aware of that. That in general, electromagnetic radiation to the right side, larger wavelength than visible light, tend to be less harmful to biologicals than the radiation to the left side of visible, which includes UV, X-ray, and gamma. For informational purposes, mainly, we'd like to also introduce you to the effects of UV irradiation on skin and biological systems. There are three forms of UV irradiation. UVC radiation is a highly energetic and it is completely absorbed by oxygen and the ozone molecules. So for the most part, UVC does not enter the earth. Okay, it's completely blocked. Ozone and oxygen protects us from that. However, UVB and UVA gets through, and this is why you wear skin block, by the way. So UVB is partially absorbed by ozone in the stratosphere, which is where ozone is. Some UVB reaches the Earth's surface where it is absorbed at the surface of the skin. So UVB hits your skin, it gets absorbed, and might cause some problems there. UVA is not absorbed by the uh, atmosphere uh, since it is less energetic than UVB. It penetrates deeper into the skin and causes more damage to underlying tissue. So this is really an awareness. And we point that out because we like to make you aware that, again, electromagnetic radiation with a lower wavelength than visible, which is below 400 nanometers, is more damaging to biological systems, humans. Electromagnetic radiation above 700, which moves infrared, microwave, is less damaging to biological systems, humans. So let's talk a little bit more about the properties of these waves. Let's start by giving you three definitions and then we will talk about the diagrams. There are three important definitions that we want to point out on this slide. One, wavelength. Wavelength, represented by lambda, is the distance between particles on successive waves so it's the distance so wavelength lambda measures the distance that's the key point okay and it basically measures that wavelength from hilltop to hilltop in other words a single wave okay so from the start of the wave to the finish of the wave and it's typically measured from hilltop to hilltop you could do valley to valley or some other point but the general way that is measured is from hilltop to hilltop. So that's your wavelength. Amplitude is the vertical distance from the middle of a wave to the peak or trough. Okay, so you take the highest point on the wave, drop a vertical line down, and that's where you get the amplitude. And it's shown in the diagrams. Okay, so take a look at the diagram. You can see where amplitude is measured, and that's important to know that feature. Frequency is the number of waves that pass through a particular point in one second. So, a wave passes through a particular point, a defined point in one second, that's a measure of its frequency. In other words, the keyword frequency, how frequent does it pass through the point? In other words, how often does that point see a wave? How frequent does that point see a wave in one second? Okay, so that's frequency. So we have wavelength, distance, amplitude, deals with the height, 
and frequency deals with how many waves pass through a fixed point per second. One cycle per second is called a hertz. So when you hear hertz, kilohertz, etc., a hertz or megahertz, it is dealing with one cycle per second equaling one hertz. So a hertz equals one cycle per second. Now when we consider wavelength versus frequency, we note that the frequency and the wavelength are inversely proportional. In other words, the longer the wavelength, the shorter the frequency. And that's important to note. The wave with the shortest wavelength has the highest frequency, and the wave with the longest wavelength has the lowest frequency. Okay? And we remind you again that the amplitude is one half the height of the wave from peak to trough. So again, this slide repeats what we've already told you about, but we just like to visually show it to you in a different way. Notice that when we have lambda 1, one wavelength, we note that we can have one wavelength that's shorter in lambda 2, and lambda 3, we can have even a shorter wavelength. We note that the frequency of the first one has three cycles per second, three hertz. The new 2, the second wave shown here has 6 hertz and we note that lambda 3 has 12 hertz so this again just shows you how that works to help you visualize the relationship between waves wavelength and frequency and also helps you to see how hertz fits into the picture. Waves can also be modulated, a form of modifying the wave, to enhance its utility. For example, a single signal can be amplified modulated, called AM, or it can be frequency modulated, called FM. This diagram depicts how AM and FM can be used to transmit a radio wave. So you have your radio wave and you can amplitude modulate it or you can frequency modulate it. Therein is why you have AM and FM radio. Okay? The AM and FM broadcast signals are forms of electromagnetic waves. AM works by varying the amplitude of the signal being transmitted while the frequency remains the same. So you keep the frequency constant and you modulate the amplitude. FM transmits by varying the frequency of the wave while keeping the amplitude constant. And this allows them to differentiate the types of signals that are sent out. In general, the FM signal can be heard further than AM signal. That's a general rule. But the real value is the ability to differentiate the waves, to be able to modulate these waves so you can differentiate the signal being sent out. That's the important beauty of it. It opened up a completely different band for broadcasting to have amplitude modulated, and frequency modulated. It should be pointed out to you that a major part of this lecture in this chapter is to share definitions and concepts to lay a foundation for further study. With that, we start to look at how we start to use this electromagnetic radiation. 
I'd like to remind you of the definition of electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation is the emission and transmission of energy in the form of electromagnetic waves, electricity type and magnetic type waves that have wave and particle properties. They are bursts of particles traveling like a wave or like dolphins jumping out of the ocean. It is a particle traveling in that type of wave pattern. When we look at that traveling wave, we discover that all electromagnetic radiation can be related to the speed of light. And that relationship is through nu lambda. Nu being the frequency, which you now know about, and lambda being the wavelength, which you also know about. So this is the equation that relates frequency and wavelength to speed of light. The speed of light is 3.00 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. So this is how they're related. And from this equation, we can start to examine electromagnetic radiation using mathematical formulas, which will allow us then to be more specific about the identity and character of these waves. So we can take our C equals nu lambda. We can rearrange it so that we can find lambda or find nu, find the wavelength, or find the frequency. You want to note again the relationship between the frequency and the wavelength. Longer wavelength has lower frequencies. Shorter wavelengths have higher frequencies. Different types of electromagnetic radiation have different wavelengths and frequencies. Okay, so these are some important summary principles that we've talked about, but we like to summarize them here. Okay, particularly knowing that different types of electromagnetic radiation have different wavelengths and frequencies. And we can mathematically relate that to the speed of light, which allows us to carry out mathematical calculations to derive value from electromagnetic radiation and to understand the properties and characteristics of electromagnetic radiation. One other important mathematical concept that we find is that we can relate lambda and nu and the speed of light to energy. And we find that energy is equal to the frequency, which is speed of light over lambda times a constant, a fudge factor called Planck's constant. All right, so if we have a wavelength, we have a frequency, we can find out the energy of that wave by using Planck's constant. And again, E will equal Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength. And you know that the speed of light divided by the wavelength is equal to the frequency. Therefore, E equals H times the frequency. So let's use these mathematical relationships to do some calculations. Here's our problem. A sodium street light gives off yellow light that has a wavelength of 589 nanometers. Note that one nanometer equals one times 10 to the minus nine meters. What is the frequency of this light? To solve this problem, we can rearrange the equation C equals lambda nu to solve for frequency. And we have the equation now of frequency nu equals speed of light divided by lambda wavelength. So for this calculation, we put in the values, we pay attention to the units. 
So we have new equals speed of light given here divided by lambda. But note that we use a conversion factor to convert this to nanometers so that the units may cancel out. So when we do the arithmetic, do the math, we get a value of 5.09 times 10 to the 14 reciprocal seconds for the frequency. The units for frequency is reciprocal seconds. So any such similar calculations may be carried out using this equation or some derivative of this equation. Let's do another problem involving energy. And here's the problem. When we see light from a neon sign, we are observing radiation from excited neon atoms. In other words, the atoms inside of the neon sign are excited. And they express that excitement by giving off light. If this radiation has a wavelength of 640 nanometers, what is the energy of the photon being emitted? So when you see light in a neon sign, photons are being emitted. The neon gets excited, it rises to a higher energy state, and as it makes its way back down, it emits the light. So here, we use the form of Planck's constant equation, lambda, and convert units of nanometers to meters so the units in lambda and C are the same. So essentially, you have to think through whether or not you have to do a conversion to units. It is critically important that you pay attention to the units. If the units don't match, a conversion will be needed. You can carry out the conversion using standard dimensional analysis mathematical processes. So we have E equals Planck's constant C lambda. Planck's constant is a standard. We look it up in a table, we memorize it, or we ask for it. We put the values in place. We add a conversion factor of one meter per 10 to the nine nanometers. And you are permitted to set up your math this way as long as it's clear that the units are canceled out and we can see them. We run the numbers through our calculator. We check the number of significant figures we should have and we record the answer. In this case, our answer is 3.1 times 10 to the minus 19 joules because we started with a wavelength of 640 nanometers which has two sig figs. So any other such calculations involving energy, speed of light, lambda nu may be carried out in this fashion by paying attention to the units, plugging them in the proper place and making sure that the units match. Now that we know how to use the formulas and do the calculations, Let's talk some more about some of the characteristics about electromagnetic energy or electromagnetic radiation. With that, let's talk about continuous spectra. Scientists in the late 19th century were struggling to understand the emission of light from atoms and molecules. What they had observed was that when solids and liquids or condensed gases were heated enough, they radiated some of the excess energy as light. Essentially, when certain metals were heated, certain liquids or condensed gases were heated, they got glows, and the glows were different for the gases and different metals. Essentially, this experiment is done in many of the freshman chemistry laboratories, where you take these ions and you put them in a Bunsen burner and you burn them. It's just that they had observed this, and this was somewhat confusing at first 
because each of them had a different appearance. Okay? And here's what they discovered. They discovered that protons produced in this manner had a range of energies, and that was a breakthrough. So the photons, not protons, but photons produced in this manner have a range of energies, and thereby producing a continuous spectrum in which an unbroken series of wavelengths is present. In other words, the different wavelengths continue. They don't exactly separate. There's not a clear line of demarcation to the natural eye. It is continuous. However, if you put this in a prism, you can see the different colors. It's what happens when the rainbow appears. The raindroppers act as a prism to separate out the various wavelengths in the light. And we can visibly see these wonderful colors. Those wonderful colors make up our visible light. But that light is continuous. So continuous light uh, is essentially what's sometimes called white light. It's continuous light. Okay? So we have this continuous series that makes up all of these different colors. Or at least is composed of these various colors. And those colors are different energies. Each of them appears at a different wavelength, and that's important. And the wavelength for visible light is between 400 and 700. And that continuous light, when we see it, we cannot see this without some way of differentiating it. And a prism or raindrops is for rainbow lets us see it. So that's continuous light, no differentiation. So what's a line spectra? Light that can occur as discrete lines is called a line spectra. It appears as this line spectra with very narrow line widths throughout the spectral region. So throughout the spectral region, you get these lines that are very discrete. You get exactly that line, that color. And that color, that line is produced at a specific wavelength. Okay? So exciting a gas at a low partial pressure using an electric current or heating it will produce a line spectrum. Again, this experiment is done many times in laboratories. So, you can get that line spectra by heating it or giving it an electric current. Each element displays its own characteristic set of lines, and that is a very important principle. Sodium is different from lithium, it's different from magnesium, it's different from all the other metals. Name a metal, they're different. Some may find very common places and appear to be the same, they each exist as its own unique characteristic line, okay? Each emission line consists of a single wavelength of light. So a very single wavelength, and that's pretty incredible, a very single wavelength of light happens or can be seen or observed or measured for that element. This implies that light emitted by gas consists of a set of discrete energies and that is an important principle. So each of these lines essentially represents a discrete energy, a discrete point of energy, a discrete location of energy. The origin of the discrete spectra in atoms and molecules was extremely puzzling again to scientists for some time until they realized that the energy of each of these atoms really did have a discrete energy or a discrete wavelength. Okay? Prior to this, they only thought that the continuous spectra existed. 
So this was an advancement in the science knowledge of electromagnetic radiation. So let's recap. Electromagnetic radiation exists as a continuous spectra. That continuous spectra can be further observed through a prism or rain droplets for a rainbow. Each element, however, displays its own characteristic set of lines and therefore you have a line spectra as well. This diagram shows you example of line spectra of elements. The first one shows you uh, the continuous spectra of white light, what's called white light on top. And then we have the line spectra for excited sodium, excited hydrogen, calcium, and mercury to give you an idea of what line spectra will look like. And these are just examples between the 400 nanometers, which is 4,000 angstrom, to the 700 nanometers, a little beyond that, which is 700 nanometers or 7,000 angstroms. We have these discrete line spectra for metals and for other excited gases. Now, this understanding about line spectra started many of the early scientists around the 1900s to really thinking about how this might relate to atoms and some of the atomic theories about atoms that were being talked about and discussed. One of those was a scientist by the name of Balmer. However, his work was advanced by Johann Rydberg, who found a general way to describe this hydrogen emission. So he developed an empirical formula that predicted that all of hydrogen's emissions lines would follow an equation. And that equation we show you here. Now, we actually will not be using this equation, but we want to expose you to it to understand what it really means. And that's what it means. What you discover is that these events really were happening very discreetly in in into and all these were integers okay and what is discovered is that n1 we'll talk about what this really means in terms of n was less than n2 okay and so on and so forth and what he discovered then is that he could relate these line spectra or the line spectra of hydrogen to this relationship, but he needed a fudge factor, and therein is the Rydberg constant. So, he can relate the wavelength to the energy levels, which is what N was found to be related to, or what N is. So, what you're seeing here, and what we're really talking about, is some of the early development of the atomic theory. We really want to expose you to that, how much of the detail you remember is somewhat questionable. However, the important principle here is that what we discovered was that the wavelength was related to the energy level of the atoms. And each of the elements expressed that differently. And there's a fudge factor that helps to relate it, which is called the Rydberg constant. Now, Moving on with the atomic theory was the Bohr model. And in fact, you will oftentimes see the literature will talk about Bohr, Rebird, depending on who writes the book. Okay? And so Bohr's contribution to what Rebird and Balmer had done looks something like this. What the Bohr model atom, which really started to solidify how we look at atoms and how we look at the atomic structure and the electronic configuration of these atoms by the combination of Balmer, Reberg, and Bohr. And here is how it became summarized. Okay? 
Bohr's work convinced scientists to abandon the classical physics model, okay, and consider what he thought to be a more robust description in what became known as quantum mechanics. In his theory, he said the following, that electrons can only have specific energy values. That description of having those discrete energy values is called being quantized. We will talk about this in a few more slides. Okay? So he said they can be very discrete. They have exactly that energy value. The other important principle from this was that light is emitted light is emitted as electrons move from one energy level in to a lower energy level. In other words, when the electrons move from a higher energy state to a lower energy state, they emit light. They emit photons, which we show you in the diagram to the right. So if you go from a higher energy on the way back down to a lower energy, it emits light. Okay? So N then describe the principal quantum numbers 1, 2, 3, etc. They were discrete integers, whole numbers. And using the Rudberg constant, we can relate that mathematically. So essentially, Johann Rudberg was correct that they did have discrete integers that represented different energy levels. However, Bohr advanced that by moving from a physics description to what is now known as quantum mechanics. So what does the Bohr model mean then? Here's what it means. The Bohr model means when the atom absorbs energy as a photon, the electrons move from an orbit with a lower end to a higher end. In other words, they move from a lower energy state to a higher energy state when they experience a photon. Okay? Or actually when they absorb that photon. And here's what happens. Next, when an electron falls from an orbit with a higher end to a lower end, the atoms emit energy as photons, or actually as a photon. So let me repeat that. When an electron falls from an orbit with a higher end to a lower end, that atom emits energy as a photon. So a photon is given off. That's what you see in light. That's what happens in fluorescent lights. It's emitting photons. Okay? Now, since delta E can only be discrete values, the photon absorbed or emitted can only have a wavelength with the discrete value. It can't be continuous. In other words, each of those photons has an exact wavelength that has an exact discrete value because the delta E can only have discrete values. It cannot be continuous. All right, so it's very discrete for, and that's how it emits. This is how we explain the line spectra for hydrogen atom. So this is how we explain the line spectra for the hydrogen atom. Okay? It creates a line spectra because it is discrete. So let's see if we can summarize what we're really saying. Here is what we're saying. Electromagnetic radiation is the emission and transmission of energy in the form of electromagnetic waves that have wave and particle properties. Particles traveling like a wave. That is important. Now, how does that relate to quantized energy? Quantized energy is the emission 
of energy in discrete bursts of photons instead of a continuous stream. And that is important. So these photons are in bursts like balls rolling down a step. You step one, it's discrete, step two, step three, and so on and so forth. And there's this energy being emitted each time it goes down a step. Quantized energy is a little bit like pressing the ice cube part on your refrigerator to get the ice cubes out. Each ice cube drops out. Then you press the button and you get the water. That's a continuous stream. Quantized energy is like ice cubes falling out of the refrigerator, not a running stream of water out of your refrigerator. And that's very important. And that's why hydrogen produces that exact line spectra. That is also why we can take advantage of different materials, different metals, different elements to produce energy. Because of our understanding of the Bohr theory and the Johann's theory and Balma's theory. Their theory helped to explain why we can harness the energy of the atom and also how we know what the energy of an atom looks like at the subatomic particle level. We have a good idea what that looks like because of this understanding of electromagnetic spectra and the emission of continuous versus line spectra and because of our understanding of quantized energy, that discrete burst of energy at a particular energy level. That ability to understand how quantized energy and wave properties was put into what's called a quantum mechanical model by Schrodinger. Again, advancing the work of others. What does a quantum mechanical model mean or look like? How do we define it? It is defined in the following way. Science dealing with the behavior of matter and light on the atomic and subatomic scale is called quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics deals with the behavior of matter and light on the atomic and subatomic scale. Quantum mechanics helps scientists to understand and describe where and how subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, electrons exist and how they interact. What is happening at this proton, neutron, electron level where we know the nucleus of an atom is composed of the protons and the neutrons and surrounding that nucleus are the electrons. Okay. How do we look at that? We look at that through what we call a quantum mechanical model or a quantum mechanical examination of this area of science. Okay. Now, quantum mechanics is an atomic concept that recognizes four quantum numbers by which electron energy levels may be described. And then it has other descriptions of how we look at what's happening at the subatomic particle level between protons, neutrons, electrons. Again, looking at the subatomic particles. And... What that all means is that we have these principal levels, we have these sub-levels, within those sub-levels we have orbitals, and then we have to consider the spin. And you're going to learn what all of this means. Learn about those principal levels, which we look at, when we look at the roles on the periodic table primarily, we look at these sub-levels, when we look at what we call the blocks along the periodic table, we look at the orbitals when we start to look at whether it's, whether it's an S, PD, orbital, X, Y, Z, orientation. So the orbital here starts looking look at the orbital orientation. And we start to look at the spin. 
and the number of electrons in an orbital. So these are the variables used in understanding quantum mechanics when it comes to subatomic particles. You're going to learn how to use these to describe the electronic nature or the electronic configuration of atoms, of elements on the periodic table. One of the important practical results of these theories was an understanding of the probability density of where electrons resided within the atomic structure. And at the end of the day, the slide at the bottom right where it shows the distance from the nucleus helps us understand that there's a higher probability that you'll find electrons near the nucleus than, than, any, than anywhere else. So it really just shows an electron density map. And that's the extent of this that we'd expect to be aware of is that from these theoretical studies by Bohr, Schrodinger, uh, Rydberg, Balmer, and others, we have a good picture, a good idea of what subatomic particles look like, what the electron density looks like with regard to the nucleus and how these electrons surround the nucleus and what that density looks like. So it basically tells us the problem where we can expect to find an electron. And as we go through the rest of this, you will see us starting to play with these electrons, particularly when we do the electron configuration, which is an indicator of where the probability of those electrons exist in an atom. That brings us to the concept of these orbitals. And not only the orbitals, but the orientation of orbitals. Okay? So, the shape of the orbitals all have names. Not too hard to memorize. And what we discovered is this. Each type of orbital has a very specific shape. And S is a sphere. That's it. In an S orbital, electrons are most likely found in a region with a sphere shape. So that's where we have a higher probability of finding these electrons, okay? There is one s orbital for every energy level. As the number of energy levels increases, the size of the sphere, the s orbital increases. So a 1s is smaller than a 2s, is smaller than a 3s, is smaller than a 4s. And again, this describes where we can expect to find the electrons. In an S orbit, we can expect to find them somewhere in this sphere. Okay? There are also P orbitals. There are three P orbitals starting with N equals 2. There are no P orbitals in N equals 1. You'll discover in lecture 2 why this is the case. Each p orbital has two lobes, like a balloon tied in the middle or dumbbells. Okay, the p orbitals are arranged perpendicular to each other along the x, y, and z axis. So this is why we talk about these orbitals with regard to orientation. Okay, so you have your x, y, z orientation, and then this shows the shape of d orbitals. We really do expect you to know these shapes to be able to recognize a d orbital. So a d orbital is like taking two p orbitals and tying the balloon, two balloons together in the center. And so here you see the different orientations of the d orbitals. I recommend looking at these and finding a way to memorize what they look like. It's not overly challenging once you recognize you're moving along your, your axes, your x, y, your y, z, and x, z, okay? And then you have the x squared minus y squared, and you have the dz D, z squared. So, you want to take a look at these and be familiar with what a d orbital looks like. And then we have our f orbitals, and all of these are related to the periodic table 
and you will be using these to do electronic configuration in lecture two. You will not be populating this look, but you will be adding electrons to orbitals based upon the electronic configuration of the element of the atom. So that would be your F orbitals. When electrons go into an orbital, they don't go in spinning the same way. One spins up, one spins down. One spins negative, the other spins positive. One spins positive, the other spins negative. This was part of what came from Schrodinger's wave equation. And that was profound because it helped define how these electrons can occupy energy levels and orbitals within those energy levels and sublevels and be able to cooperate to exist as a stable atom. So in order for them to exist together, they spin one one way and one the other. We typically write these as spin up, spin down. That's the convention for most. Spin up, spin down. But you could be a maverick and do it left, right. I wouldn't advise that, by the way. But as long as they're going in opposite directions, that's the key principle. It was found that in order for these orbitals to occupy that space, it required one to have a spin up, spin down, or one positive, one negative. That existence of these electrons with their spin up and spin down is how the periodic table is arranged. It's arranged with these electrons showing probability in S, P, D, F orbitals of where those electrons are and showing them with a spin up, spin down when they occupy the same orbital, the same sublevel, the same space. In order to occupy that region, spin up, spin down. And we show you this very busy chart to give you an idea of that with these electrons in. So as we move forward, we will be showing you how to do electronic configuration, but we want you to periodically look back at how to do it from the periodic table. The periodic table is already arranged according to its electronic configuration. So we will be showing you a couple of ways to look at that periodic table and understand how these electrons in each of these elements fits within the periodic table structure, fits its electronic configuration, and is consistent with what we now know about the atomic theory of atoms and elements. With that, that concludes Lecture 1, of Chapter 5, Electronic Structure and Periodic Properties of Elements.